Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have such a wonderful conversation ahead. Uh, welcome to all. I'm sending you wishes for safety and peace tonight and always. I'm Allison Green Myers. I'm the program director here at the Highlights Foundation. And um, I'm here to welcome you to the um, HF Gather for the month of February. With me tonight from the Highlights Foundation is our executive director, George Brown. Hi, George. Nice to see you. And I can see already um, as attendees, many of our Highlights Foundation um, team members. So welcome to all of you. Um, a note for you as our guests who are gathering, um, this is a webinar, so we can't see your video. We can't hear your audio during the session, but we can see you in the chat and we can see you in the Q&A feature. There are closed captions available if you'd like to use them. And of course, closed captions will be included when you watch the recording or have the recording sent to you. If you're here with us live, we have the chat enabled for hosts and panelists to be able to see your messages right now. And then I'll open it up fully in just a moment so you can chat with everyone. Um, we would love for you to use the Q&A feature, though, to list questions, not the chat. The chat seems to go very, very quickly, and we don't want to miss any great questions that you have for us during the conversation. In these spaces, in the chat, on Zoom, really anywhere we come together as the Highlights Foundation, we ask for your respectful engagement. We ask you to join us tonight and always with no hate, no harm, and no harassment of any kind. I'll place a link to our community standards in the chat for those of you who are really just getting to know us um, or for those of you who would like to read our full commitment um, that we bring to our programs, which includes safety and inclusivity as much as we can everywhere we go. Um, when we were thinking about tonight's gather in particular, Heather and I went back and forth with a lot of titles. We were trying to think about titles. And so, Heather, I thought it might be nice to give just a little bit of background um, because tonight's gather grew from a 2022 program that we held in partnership with Rebecca Dykes Writers. It was an effort to support creatives who are called to tell stories of their lived experiences, especially when it comes to writing about trauma and grief, and especially in wanting to do it respectfully and authentically for children and teens. Some of the stories shared at that 2022 program included picture books about loss and also about love and middle grade novels about bullying, but also about finding community. And there were many young adult novels about pain, but also about the journey to recovery. And so tonight's gather is meant to bloom from that first program and grow some new stories. I'll offer my gratitude by starting out um, to Heather and to Linda and to Sarah. They're here to share their perspectives with us. Um, and I have to say, they'll be sharing an awful lot of vulnerability too when it comes to writing and sharing stories that come from the heart. Um, I think they're very personal um, and quite profound. Um, and I think right now, especially, um, these stories are being asked to share more and more, um, and authors for kids and teens are being asked to really put our hearts out there, um, to show up and show our vulnerability. We're asked to uncover stories that we wish we had when we were experiencing a multitude of challenges as we were young. We were also trying to grow then and go forward, and we're still trying to grow and go forward. So I thank you, Heather and Sarah and Linda, for trusting our community tonight to share these stories. For those of you listening right now or reading the transcript, check in with yourself during tonight's discussion. Um, when we talk about it and when you craft stories that really come from the heart, come from those tough lived experiences, you never know what kind of personal connections will flood in. Um, if you need to pause, please do. If you need to take a deep breath, please do. I ask you to join us tonight open-hearted. These will be a lot of stories shared. You might even share some things with us when we open up the chat. 
come to it with respect, come to it with tenderness. Think about those kids who need to hear those stories right now. So we'll have a conversation between Heather and Sarah and Linda, and then I'll come back at the end with some questions um, that you'll be putting in the Q&A feature. Um, but first, let's start with Heather, Heather Dimitrios. Um, Heather, for those who don't know you, I've had the pleasure to know you for just a few years and have enjoyed our time together so much. Um, this subject, uh, the topic tonight, and really the program with Rebecca Dykes Writers, um, it's it's pretty pretty personal to you. You have a lot of connections to it. I wonder if you might open up by sharing a little bit about yourself and how you connect to tonight's conversation. Yeah, first, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight, uh, for showing up with your full selves and everything that has happened in your life and is happening and will happen and for your tender care of your readers. Um, before I say anything, I just want us all to take a collective breath because I think, you know, what we're talking about, what we're working with, you know, the more we can feel connected to our bodies and to ourselves, the more that we're able to tap into the stories that want to be told and that need to be heard. So if you want to just take a minute, if you want to put your feet on the ground and just feel your connecting of your body to wherever you are. So if you're sitting, if you're laying down, whatever you're doing, just noticing those points of contact. If it feels honest, you can put a hand on your heart or your belly. You don't have to. And then just taking in a deep breath into your nose and filling your belly, and then breathing out any tension. And we'll just do that two more times together, in through the nose, and out through the mouth. And one last time, in and out. I love the idea of all of us breathing together, and that sense of connection, which is really what this work is about. Um, so as Allison was saying, this, this whole program that we're doing with Highlights is very personal to me. Um, I will start for those of you that don't know me, I'm a predominantly YA author, and I got my MFA in writing for children at Vermont College of Fine Arts. I'm sure many of you in the chat have some connection to VCFA. Linda and I were actually in the same class together there as was Jane Hong, who is the founder of Rebecca Dykes Writers. And Rebecca Dykes was her daughter. And um, she died as a result of gender-based violence. And Jane's reaction to that was to continue her daughter's legacy of humanitarian work. She was an aid worker in Lebanon with the British government. And also to build on her own desire to tell stories. And she thought, what better way to help protect vulnerable young women and really people by then telling stories. And so together we kind of worked out what that would look like and began working with highlights. And so the work that we do really is a combination of things. One, how do we help support writers who want to tell these stories that are really painful and difficult to tell, either because of a personal experience or someone close to you, um, or a topic that you are really activated by and you want to talk about for young people. Um, I myself have a novel called Bad Romance that was based on dating violence that I experienced in high school, as well as um, different other forms of abuse. And it was really interesting when I was trying to tell people about the book and, you know, they wanted to know what, what's the love story? And it's like, well, actually... <laughs> It's, it's a love story of someone falling in love with themselves because it's a, you know, an unhealthy relationship. And that kind of took some people aback. And when I was writing that novel, I was, was so alone because I didn't have a toolbox yet for how to navigate going back through reading my diaries from high school and didn't expect the nightmares, didn't expect the various responses I was having to the work or the challenges of trying to take my life and turn it into a novel, as well as another aspect that we work on is how to help writers craft stories that don't traumatize or re-traumatize readers. So how can you help someone feel seen in your book, their experience reflected without 
causing harm, right? So really that whole mantra of do no harm. And so that was something that Jane and I worked on a lot. What would that look like? And what would it look like to create a supportive environment for writers to explore their stories and get that toolbox of support? So that's how we ended up with Rebecca Dykes Writers and the series of empowering young readers and um, writing from the heart. So that's kind of my my background with everything. Um, Allison, do you want me to share more or do you want me to jump into some questions or? I appreciate that. I think it was just a nice grounding for kind of starting the conversation. I'm going to hide <gasps> myself and let you engage in the conversation. And now there's a puppy on the screen. Um, and just a reminder to our community, if you'd like to put messages in the chat, you're welcome, but please place questions in the Q&A feature and I'll turn things over to you, Heather. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy that we have a puppy for this work. I highly recommend having cute, furry beings around when you're writing difficult material. Um, so Sarah, I wanted to start with you. And I'm going to read my questions because I wrote them pretty well, I think. <laughs> so my question for you, and also please share a little bit about your background, because I know, well, for everyone else, um, Sarah was a facilitator at our first retreat that we had at Highlight. And it was incredible just to get to hear her story and the book that she was working on. And I'm sure she'll tell you all more about that. Um, but also just the wisdom that she she shared about how to navigate writing personal material and what does that look like and how do you take care of yourself while you're doing that? So, Sarah, what have been some of the challenges you've encountered writing your own story, putting it out into the world? And then second part of the question how did you work with them to get to where you are now with your book, working with those challenges? Yes, thank you. I first want to just apologize uh, if I seem distracted. I'm listening, but my puppy who sleeps at this time is wide awake. <laughs> um, and so I think he knows I'm in a workshop, but um, my partner's traveling. So I, I apologize, but um, he's he will be good. He just might pop in and out. So yeah, so I started writing. So my first, let me just share in its current form, my novel is young adult. Um, some might say it's historical fiction, which I can't handle because it's set in the early 90s. But it is, um, let me give you my one sentence pitch. 15 year old Sarai Brooks must learn how to break free from the cult's indoctrination find faith in herself and become fierce and brave like Queen Jezebel if she is to become the loving parent she never had. And its current title is Jezebel. Um, and it originated as memoir because I grew up in a fundamentalist religion, very patriarchal, very abusive, um, especially towards women. And um, I thought that my childhood was was quote normal. I know that's not a word we use, but that's how I felt back then until my friends as an adult said, uh, no, <laughs> people don't grow up like that. And so I decided to write the story. The challenges I faced in writing it was really just going back through my trauma and not recognizing a lot of uh, abuse and, and patterns of abuse and cycles and trauma until I read the first draft. Um, and then honing that and figuring out what to include and not include was tough. And also the way the story ended, it ended with the birth of my son. I was a teen mom. I am, well, yeah, I'm still a mom, um, but he, I was a teen when my son was born. Um, and it, it didn't end the way I wanted it to, but I was like, okay, this is how it ends. It ends with hope. She has a child. She can move forward, even though I like in that moment in time, everything wasn't perfect. Not that it ever is. So I got an agent. Um, it took me two and a half years to find my first agent. And she sent it out to a bunch of editors. And all the young adult editors said, oh, I love this, but uh, it's too dark for YA. Um, this was back in like 2016. And then all the adult editors said, oh, I love this, but it's totally YA. And one editor said, oh, I really love this, but I can't buy a memoir if you're not a celebrity. Would you fictionalize it? 
So she really got me thinking. And that I think was a bigger challenge than writing my memoir because it's really it was really difficult for me to divorce the actual life events I went through to give this character and her experiences and her family um, a whole new story, but with the same feelings and sentiment. What I, I loved about that experience, it took me five years to revise everybody. <laughs> um, and what I loved about the experience though, is I was able to rewrite my history and ultimately give my teenager self the ending I wish that I actually had at that age. Uh, my son is now 27 and, and successful and wonderful, which is great. Um, so I would say those are the biggest challenges. And for anyone who ever hears that an agent or editor is interested in their work, really there's no time limit. The editor that loved it five years ago is one of the people my age, my now, my agent left agenting. So now I have a new agent. Um, but that aid, that editor is reviewing it now. It doesn't mean she'll buy it, but she was so excited that I finally finished it after five years. <laughs> and Sarah, can I ask a follow-up question? Because as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, my own experience writing. My It was a memoir at first, and then I changed it to fiction because that's what my editor suggested. And at first I was resistant, but then ultimately felt really happy with that I felt like it gave me a little like that little bit of distance to actually go deeper into the material and deeper into the hard stuff because there was just like that little buffer of safety and then when I finished the book I I felt like it was a really healing experience for me really cathartic I'm curious for you did you experience that buffer did you experience catharsis would you say writing this novel was healing for you not that it has to be I'm just curious yeah um it really was um, cathartic. One th one thing I that I realized fictionalizing helped me do was actually add in. I it, it was it became more honest and raw because I realized I was holding back certain things because I don't know why. <laughs> like so, I really was able to delve into um, more of the emotional feelings and the repercussions of growing up suppressed and, and, um, oppressed and all the words. Um, so, uh, it was definitely cathartic. And one of my favorite things is my brother was 27 when he died and he, when he left the religion, um, he died in a car accident and we were taught if you leave the religion, God will kill you. And so he, to me back then I was very young. Um, we were much age difference. I felt like, um, obviously you can't leave the religion. God really does kill you. So I fictionalized him and made him, um, only a year older than the sis, the, the main character. And even though that Michael is a completely different Michael than my brother, it, I felt like I got to revisit my relationship with my brother, which feels really bizarre. <laughs> um, and I even had a dream where he like approved of this younger version of himself, which um, I believe he really came to visit me because he's only come to me once before. So um, that felt very, very healing in so many ways. And how did you take care of yourself as you were writing this book? Because, you know, you're having these dreams, you're having all of this stuff coming up. Um, did you did you have outside support? Did you have practices that you engaged with or was the writing itself really the support? Yeah, no. So I have um, a cr couple critique partners. So I was able to call them when I felt overwhelmed, when I was like, what am I doing? When it reopened um, wounds, I didn't realize that weren't fully healed. Um, at one point, I actually started going to a therapist again, because I was like, um, I, I really need to take care of myself. And, and you know, I feel like I've, I'm open to a whole can of worms, like even though I'm fictionalizing this and that she helped me get through. Um, also, uh, shameless plug, but uh, the Rebe Rebecca Dykes uh, workshop was was just really, really helpful. It gave me, even though I was faculty, I walked away with just as much resources as the attendees did. Um, it, it just 
Heather, all the all the meditative things and self care and all the other faculty just really um, helped us all learn different ways to tap into healing and how to um, know when to stop. If that like when to stop writing and take care of yourself. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I I kept thinking as you were talking, just almost like seeing you telling your story to us and just the ripple of resonance that went around that group of women. And I mean, I myself have experienced so much spiritual abuse from a fundamentalist childhood. And I know other people were telling you the same. And it was like you telling your story was so healing for us to be like, oh, I'm not alone. And like, we can tell these stories and it's safe to do so. Um, and Highlights, of course, is such a good place, a good container for that work. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. So Linda, as you're sitting here, um, I was just thinking, you know, as Sarah's talking about her different agents and, and you're an agent, of course. And um, one thing my, everyone might not know about you is just the, the easy manner and the warmth that you carry into every room. And I just feel anybody working on challenging material would feel so safe having you as an agent that you would really have the patience. Like you were talking earlier when we were talking beforehand that you've had writers who spent like two decades working on the story. And it's like, yeah, that's how long it takes. There's not like this pressure, you know, and especially with this kind of work, we can as writers hit those speed bumps and you're a writer too. So, you know, where you're like, yeah, I'm going, I'm going. And then you're like, whoa, that was really intense. And now I need a break. And so it seems like, you know, you have the capacity to offer that to your writers. So I have so many questions for you. Um, one is kind of off of what Sarah was saying that, you know, all of these people were saying the story is so dark. And I keep hearing from writers, you know, um, no one's going to want my story because it's centering trauma. It's heavy. You know, um, it may or may not have a happy ending because what happened still happened, right? And so I'm curious, just what is your advice for writers? Um, what are you seeing in the industry? I feel like I'm seeing a lot more openness to these kinds of stories, but I'm not in the trenches in the way that you are. So if you have a writer coming to you saying like, I want to tell this story, but I don't want to pour my whole heart into this and then just get rejected because it's too heavy. What are your thoughts on all of this? I know that's like a big <laughs> topic. No, no, no. I mean, that's a good question, man. And it's a big, you're right. It's a big question. Whenever we have conversations, generally, you know, agents will have those at our meetings, lunches, what have you. They don't necessarily talk in terms of trauma. They'll usually say things like um, more and more, they've been wanting things that are trendy, right? They'll say, we want things that are trendy. We want escapism, you know, a lot of genre. They want things like that. And there have been, oh, there have been a little bit, there's been a little bit more interest in darker things. However, I find it super interesting how editors, and this still happens a lot, editors don't mind, they don't use the word dystopia anymore, but things like that, like when you think of the Hunger Games and people killing each other and um, there's trauma there, right? And within that story and all those kinds of stories, they don't mind when it's wrapped in a particular genre, but when you do things like contemporary realistic fiction, it just, it seems to surprise them. I don't know why. Like, I think it feels maybe too real as opposed to saying dystopian or horror, this particular genre, which we can use it as escapism. And you still have, have all of those great truths wrapped up within those genres. So I'm finding that editors still struggle with something that sometimes feels too real. However, <laughs> It's all subjective, right? It, it's really subjective. You have to be willing to, and this sucks, but you have to be willing to be rejected. It's like bracing yourself for that because yeah, there are going to be some editors who are going to go, well, that's just too much for me. I, I, I can't deal with that. And I've encountered that even when I've done things where it was something super, super genre. I think one was like a mystery and a child was missing in the mystery and so a person went, oh, no, I'm a mother. I just, I, I cannot read stuff like this. I'm like, oh, that's fair. I didn't think about that. But that makes perfect sense. Like now that I have pets, like I'm very sensitive to pet things. You know, I, I've always been sensitive for animals, but now it just feels a different level. So there's some people that 
if they see things like fundamentalist religion or, you know, re, you know, abuse with a boyfriend, they're just going to be like, no, I, I can't do it. Um, but it doesn't mean that there are no editors who, who won't. They're just, you know, it's a matter of finding that right person. And it is going to be a bit harder, a little bit, especially if you're writing contemporary. And again, there's so many categories, right? I think if we're talking about picture books, I am seeing an interesting trend towards more concepts that are darker a little bit because they're they're encapsulating it in social emotional learning. So they are, remember Heather, when I did the picture book semester, I did a whole thing about grief and picture books. And I was like, we need more. We're seeing stuff come out of that. So I think the picture book space, we're seeing a little bit more of that. That's really great. It's still not the same kind of conversation they're having abroad versus here. You know, it's a very different kind of picture book. Um, middle grade, I feel like the sky's the limit. Um, and YA too, but I feel like, again, it's, yeah, there are going to be some editors who are afraid to touch it. They want that escapism. You know, some of them, for instance, will refuse to talk about the pandemic in stories, right? Like, you know, it's, people have gone through traumas of the pandemic on top of everything else. And a couple editors will go, yeah, I'd be open to it. But more often than not, they're like, eh, they don't want to live in the now. They just want to live somewhere else. But again, I've definitely had editors where I've reached out and I'll go, okay, I know you don't usually do this, but look at the story. So that's like even me as an agent. I don't like to say I don't do certain things because I never know what I'm going to like. And I am always surprised because it really is in the execution. Because even when I go to pitch sessions, I find pitch sessions are not super helpful for me as an agent because I can love the pitch. I can hate the pitch. And a lot of my clients write okay pitches, <laughs> you know, like even with their queries, perfectly fine. Nothing amazing, nothing terrible. There's some who are really good, but it's all in the writing and then the execution. And so, especially when you're writing for Kidlet, I get the question constantly where they'll say, Linda, I'm writing, you know, maybe abuse, you know, like maybe the parent is physically abusive and it's middle grade. Can I do it? And I go, yes, it just depends on how you do it. So it's always execution. What is the story, right? What's the premise, right? Because you're still writing towards a market if you're talking about traditional publication, right? Self-publishing is its own thing. But if you're talking about, I want traditional, I want a bigger house, you know, you are going to tailor it if you are looking for a certain kind of publication. But don't be afraid to write about serious things because it's all dependent on how it's wrapped up in the story. I think it's, I really appreciate what you said about editors coming to our our work their own histories yeah. um you know it's like they are people too and they have histories too and and so when you do get a rejection it might have literally nothing to do with you or your writing and i think for people working in this space that that's really helpful to hear just to calibrate the reactions we get to those rejections right. um do you have sort of places that you kind of point writers to when they start to feel discouraged, when they have a story they want to tell and they know there's precedent. Like I think about what Jamie saw, for example, as a, as a middle grade, right? That's a hard book to read, but beautiful and important. Um, there are always going to be those books, but it right. can feel so difficult when you're right. like getting those rejections. Is, is there something that you say, okay, you know, here's this thing I want you to read or a, an anecdote that you find helpful. Like I think about um, my novel, Little Universes. Um, it came out during the pandemic. So obviously it didn't sell well, but I, I was discouraged about that. But then I got an email. I think it was like an Instagram message from a female reader who said, mm -hmm. I was thinking about killing myself. Mm -hmm. And then I read your book where the character has a drug addiction and is suicidal. And then she came out of it and I knew that I could get out of it too. And wow. so thank you. And it's just like, holy crap. Like yeah. it doesn't matter about the numbers, you know, but it's like, yeah. you know, I don't get to tell that story that often. And it's like, mm -hmm. I want writers to know, like you're writing for that person, you know, but I don't know what, yeah. what advice yeah. do you give? Yeah. I, I usually use anecdotes because, you know, even when I try to think of, 
the people who've written certain raw material, you think of like Ellen Hopkins and, you know, certain people who are famous, but not everyone reaches that level of fame, nor do you have to, to be quote unquote successful, to make a living somewhat as a writer. And that's debatable what that means. Right. But if you want to get your book published, the question is, I always say, why, you know, what, what are you, yes, you can want to see, hold your book in your hand, want Barnes and Noble. You know, I mean, I get excited too. So, I mean, it's a whole other level when it's your baby, right? But if that's the only thing that's driving you, that's not sustainable, right? If you, if you know, like it's one thing to say, yeah, I'd love to be a bestseller and I have all of these, you know, goals. But if you only focus on that, you're just, you're going to peter out. It just, it, even if you hit that goal, all right, you're a New York Times bestselling author. What about the next book? What, how, you know, it, it, and with publishing one minute, you're here, one minute, you're there. It's a roller coaster ride, you know, whether you're the writer, whether you're the agent editor, it's, it's just a maelstrom. So I would say you really have to remind yourself why you're writing, like who, who are you reaching out to? And yeah, a lot of it is, I have so many clients you know, some I've taken on, most of them are debuts, but some of them I've taken on. I'm there maybe third or fourth agent. You know, they used to do well, maybe now not so much, you know, various levels of their career. And there is no timeline. And I think that's what's so hard about it because you want to know, I put my heart and soul into this book. Something needs to come out of it. And sometimes that book is a learning tool for you to get to your next book. That's what it is, right? Sometimes that story isn't ready for now. I've had clients where, like one of them from VCFA, actually, Shamile said Mendez, the book that I took her on for, we only sold it, I think, seven years into our partnership. You know, so you it, it wasn't ready before, clearly it became ready later. And one other person too, she was writing... Um, uh, contemporary, realistic, YA, bordering adult. And that was a thing, like some adult editors were like, this is YA. And then some of the Y editors, this is adult. Like we can't agree on anything. And marketing is all very arbitrary as well. But we eventually sold her book and it literally took seven years of going back and forth and trying to figure out what it was. And there was some tough stuff in there that some editors were just like, I, I don't know about this. And it was really hard for some people's stomach, frankly. But it happens. And there's somewhere we're still hoping that book comes about. And it breaks my heart to say, yeah, we haven't sold it. Hopefully we do, but I can't guarantee it. But I really have to bring them back to, why are you doing this? Really, what is it? And it does help if they get a fan letter, you know, like, you know, especially when one of my clients who was doing really well, but during the pandemic, of course, sales flagged as most did. And she was feeling really down about it. And she got this fan letter from a little girl and it just changed everything. So it really does have to go back to the why of it. And again, it really cannot be just about accolades because I was telling my clients, it's the, you know, like the icing on the cake. Great. I'm going to be so excited if all these things happen, but is that the only thing that's going to make you happy? And some people I can tell, like in the conversations when I'm going to take them on as a client, you know, I'm not for everybody and they're not for, you know, it, it's a two-way street, right? So I'm never going to be the agent to say, I'm going to get you the New York Times bestseller list. I'm going to get you six figures because I can't guarantee that. I would love all of that to happen. But if I get the sense that the client is only going to be happy with those kinds of deals, then I'm not the person for them. But frankly, even if you are that person, you really have to ask yourself, what else is sustaining me, even with all that ambition? It's just so, it's so dangerous sometimes. I love that heart-centered approach. And I feel like both of you are just such, like you're really tapped into Kidlet, why it matters. Obviously it was important for you as you were growing up. Um, I always say books saved me. You know, that's what got mm -hmm. me through the toughest parts of my life growing up and a huge part of why I'm a writer. So that why is so important. And for our upcoming retreat, we're talking about among the faculty, um, you know, how books are windows and mirrors, right? We see ourselves reflected, but we also get a window into possibility. And I think that's what makes Kidlet so special is there is that kernel of hope. Like no matter what is happening in the book, there is that bit of hope at the end. And so for both of you, I'm just curious um, what's coming up as we're having this conversation, just in terms of, 
you know, encouraging writers, you're both writers, you're both agents um, on this journey, because it's a tough one. Why is it worth it? Like, why do we keep doing this to ourselves? <laughs> Um, I'll say for me, I'm doing it because when I was younger, it was really hard for me to find books that, um, reflected what I was going through. And I also wasn't allowed to read, uh, like all my books had to be approved. So mm -hmm. like I snuck a lot of books, <laughs> but it was just really, you know, difficult. Um, and for me, the giver was the book that just really saved me but my mother gave it to me once we were out of the religion um and it's funny because the ending of that which i'm not going to tell you what the actual ending is if mm -hmm. you haven't read the book but um there's kind of debate on on if it's a good ending or a bad ending and i was the only person like kid around that was like this is a good ending and everyone was like uh no it's the opposite of what you think and to this day i still have not read um Sun, which is the follow-up book mm -hmm. because I just I know like I have to read it I own it but yeah. I'm so like <laughs> hanging on to just like my like feeling of what happened to those characters yeah. um so my, I really really want to be able to help teen moms realize that their life is not over that they can be successful that um yeah. you can be a teenager and a mother and whatever else you want to be in life, right? Like it, it's not one thing or the other. And um, I, and most of my friends were teen moms. It's just how like my community was. So yeah. um, that's why I write. And I will be damned if this book, this book is like, <laughs> never. it better come out one day. That's all I got to say. <laughs> yeah, I have hope. I have hope for sure. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the thing about writing I it's like you can't help yourself, right? I, I don't think it's, I mean, you have to make the choice to commit to it, definitely. But it's, even if you don't, you feel a difference when you're not writing, right? There's that whisper. And you, it, it's it's just something that that's always there. And even when I was a kid, I never, I was not the best at expressing myself, you know, face-to-face -face in person. But writing, I always felt freer in the way I could talk. So I just always felt more open on the page. And even before, even in high school and college, a lot of that was just journaling, right? Or just journaling my emotions, my feelings, and it made such a, a, a difference. So I just don't think we have a choice, honestly. You can certainly suppress it. I mean, is it hard to do? Um, I love Netflix and I definitely um, watch a lot of TV and I most I prefer to talk about writing than actually writing half the time. But I feel a difference when I am writing, even if it's just for myself. And that's what I always say too. like whenever a client is stuck, whenever I'm stuck, if you just take the pressure off and just write the thing, you don't even know half the time what's going to come out and your subconscious will always figure it out for you until you put on the editorial hat. Even for me, because I used to work in marketing, a big struggle I've had for so long was I'd start writing a story and I'll go, oh, that's not marketable. And, you know, you keep the agenting hat, the marketing. I'm like, I don't know. Like, that's not a thing today. Like if I make it like werewolves and romance, maybe that's a thing. But it just, it, when you start to do that to yourself, it it doesn't feel real anymore, you know? So yeah, I just don't think we have a choice. But I would say even in terms of the quote unquote happy endings, right? What a good ending versus a bad ending you don't have to wrap everything up in a pretty bow. It just, is there some element of hope, right? A light at the end of the tunnel. And I like those endings. I always think of like Guillermo del Toro movies where, how, you know, you could read them either way, you know? I like to think of the optimistic way. Some people don't, that's okay, but you can go either direction. And I think if you at least have that, where there's an element of hope, you'll be fine. And don't make it cookie cutter boring because no one's going to want that anyway honestly. Like, I think it's boring and that doesn't feel real anyway. And I think that goes back to, to what um, Sarah was saying about how writing that book, you know, she had, it sounds like you had to write it, like it was coming out of you and that, you know, it hasn't sold yet, but you already have dividends from it, right? You're already seeing 
the healing that happened, the beautiful dream with your brother, like all of this processing that you did. And then even being positioned to sit here and tell us that story, probably more articulately than you ever have because you've gone through this whole thing. And man, I've never heard anyone talk about teen moms the way you just did. Like I, I can't wait for this book to come out because that is a voice that's just, it is not heard. It is not heard in YA. And, um, and I think it just kind of back to what you were saying, Linda, about that sense of like, you just have to do it. And, um, you know, getting market out of your head. I, I talk about mm-hmm. that as the Greek chorus. I'm like, that's the Greek chorus. It's right. market. It's your agent. It's this, it's that. They need to exit stage left, right. you know, and it's just you and the work. And you right. know that at the end of the day, no matter what happens, like you, you wrote that book for yourself, right? right? You yeah. did that. And that was good for you. And who knows the ripple effect of just doing that, right? right. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. I expect we have questions, Allison, do we? You do. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And many of the things that you've already talked about really have helped with some of the, the questions that are that are in the Q&A. Um, one, there's one question that looks like a thread and about three other questions in the Q&A. And it reminds me of a conversation that we had last year, the program. And I remember that Isaac Fitzsimons actually spoke about it. And um, the question is, how do you handle your family? (laughs) And in that, you know, do you remember Isaac talking about that? Um, But how do you, how do you, and that can be, you know, we're, we're smiling and laughing about it, but it can also be hurt, you know, that when we come into stories, when we're telling our experiences, they really are our experiences. If you have siblings, you know that your siblings might have been at the exact same event as you, but their perspective on things are just completely different. So can you speak a little bit to that? If you're really writing from this personal space, if you're really telling these experiences and there are people, maybe your family or friends, uh, other caregivers that are that are alive and, and could be reading it and impacted by it. How do you handle that? Um, so I just want to say I'm laughing because um, it's family is really like the hardest part, I think, of writing about your life. Um, so the way I deal with it is um, my family has never read the book, my any portion of my book whatsoever. Um, and I have certain family members that are really anxious about it, or I will, you know, they will tell me things, um, like didn't happen a certain way. I'm like, okay, but they did from my perspective. Um, and my favorite thing I like to share with, um, writers is every single person's experience, even if you're all in the same room is completely different. So I had one traumatic event in my story that I had no idea where my little sister was. And so I asked her, where were you when this happened? And she said, I was right there in the room and I am 46 years old. I was 14 when that event happened. And to this day, I have no, I do not see her. I see every detail of that room. I see every detail of like, know what happened. I feel everything. She's not there. So she was there though. She, so my point is my experience is not my sister's experience, but it's still, both of us have the, our truths. So I, I just like to, when my family does eventually read the book, anything, you know, first of all, it's fiction now. So (laughs) that's not you. It's fiction. I had to dramatize things, whatever. But um, your truth is always your truth. And and I actually recommend not having people read things until at least it's complete to a place that you feel very happy with it because they can change uh, your history with not even meaning to. Yeah, for me, I, um, my book, Bad Romance, which, you know, has already gone through the process and been published. Um, I asked my mom not to read it. I usually send her a copy of my book before they come out. And I did not send her one. And I told her, like, I don't want you to read it. Um, 
I'm sure she probably did. But, you know, um, before I started really working on the book in earnest, I talked to my sister because a big part of the book deals with a lot of stuff that happened at home that was really, really tough. And she is a big part of that. And so even though it's my story and I know I have every right to tell it, I checked in with her and she said, I'll back you. Mostly I would need someone to back me up, you know, if I could, if the family came for me. Um, and then the other thing was originally it was a memoir and I actually talked to legal at my, my, one of my publishers, which is Macmillan. And um, they said, you know, you'd probably win the court case, but this ex-boyfriend of yours could totally sue you. Um, and so I decided to make it fiction because I was like, I don't want to be in court with that guy, like basically. And it ended up being the right decision. But there were a lot of, there was a lot of calculus involved. And since the books come out, I, I haven't experienced anything negative. Everything's just been like people say thank you because I went through that relationship too, or my daughter is, or my friend is. So I think, um, I know a lot of people get really in their heads about the family thing. And Mary Carr talks about this really well in her book, The Art of Memoir, which if you haven't read it, great craft book. Um, and she, she talks all about, you know, the family thing. And it's a really personal decision for everybody. And no one decision is the right one. It's just the one that you're comfortable living with. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's in terms of conversations, especially when I have them with clients, it really is that where it's, you know, what's your pain tolerance, <laughs> you know, for certain things and having those open dialogues, but really it's all ditto here. It's, I wish we could say, well, do a, you know, step a, B, C, D, but it really does depend on the person. Like I'm in a situation now with writing something. I'm like, I'm going to have to, and my mom's involved in this particular thing. I'm like, I'm going to have to like mention something, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I don't want her. Am I going to have her read it now? No, but I might give her a heads up about something in case she feels a certain way about it. But that's how I would approach it. It depends on the person. I think that's, I just want to you add know, one but, last thing. Yeah. Um, also because of me being just wanting to not upset any of my family members, I don't, I never talked about writing it. If they ask me, oh, how's your project going? I would say, oh, it's going like, just be very vague. Um, oh yeah, I'm searching for agents. Oh yeah, I have an agent. Like, but only if they asked and I would never give them like real answers, like just very generic, vague answers. Yeah, I think that's great. I was surprised. Um, uh, well, when my family read my book. I um, ended up having a conversation with my father that was about 35 years in the works. And I honestly think had a fictional story never come into the world about something, you know, and uh, my dad could see a reflection of my mother in it um, that we never would have had that conversation. Was I worried about other people in my family seeing it? Sure. But I'm glad that, you know, that conversation was had and it was hard. I'm sure he did feel a little hurt, but I think that um, writing can be a journey for us as the writer. And it can also be a big part of um, what we give to our family. That is why we write things down too. Um, it makes me think a little bit this, there's a few questions in here. And I think this one's really important. Um, just, I think a week ago, we finished a multi-month program um, with our Muslim storyteller course in children's book publishing. Um, and one of the storytellers was talking about just right now, particularly how painful it is um, and how hard it is to create. And um, one of the things that they shared was um Sometimes writing soothes, and sometimes we have to realize that writing can wait for us. And I love that thought, you know, Linda, you were sharing a little bit about working with clients, and it's a that eagerness to put something out or get something out, and then sometimes taking taking it in and saying, can it wait for 
for me to be ready for it too. That big story, this big piece, this big thing that I have to say, Sarah, like the story you've created, you know, it, it's waited for you to get to this point. And um, so many people are asking, okay, so I've waited and I've told it and it's sold and it's coming and how do you actually prepare for sharing that much of your heart with the world? What do you think? You know, I, I always tell clients to um, keep their support system around them, right? To whether it's family, friends, whoever it is, to really keep them around you. Because, yeah, like when you, you're you bearing your soul <laughs> and they're going to be people who are, you know, it's no longer your story, right? Once you put it out there, it's yours, but it's not exactly yours. They they interpret it as they will. And you're going to get many interpretations that are going to shock you, <laughs> you know, in ways um, that are not going to be the most uh, pleasant reactions, but you're also going to have some great interactions. It's just, you have to be willing to take those unpleasant ones but the only way I think that you can best handle it is by keeping that support system to know that you're not alone you know whether you know talk to your agent talk to your friends talk to everybody around you because it's I'm, I'm not going to pretend and say it's easy it's it's not it's going to be an emotional roller coaster which you can prepare as much as possible but it's hard to tell until you're in it which is why please support system is so critical Yeah, I think um, many people know this about me, but I, I'm a meditator, I'm a meditation teacher, and um, I had a really hard time when um, my first books came out. It's just like, you know, your biggest dream in the world comes true, and we all react to that differently. Our systems react to that differently, and um, I actually fell into a really deep depression, um, which is not actually uncommon for a lot of people. Um, when those sorts of things happen in your life, it's just, you've been working so hard and then it happens and you're kind of like, now, now what, you know? And so for me, that's how I found meditation. And I think having a practice that cultivates compassion for myself was so essential because we, we all have our inner critics. We are our toughest, toughest critics. We have a job where anybody can give us performance reviews on the internet whenever they want, you know? Um, people say things and they don't mean to, but it, it, it'll hit you in different ways. And I, and also it's just a tough, it's a tough world out there for us as creatives. And we're trying to manage our energy, you know, keep working on the next project, which is what I always tell people, like start working on another project, you know, don't get caught in this, like my book's out and this is all I'm doing is promoting. But um, I think if you can find, you know, that support system as Linda was talking about, and then some kind of, spiritual technology, some kind of emotional ballast to support you, a daily practice where you are really checking in with yourself and not getting way lost up in the clouds of worry and anxiety. Um, and then celebrate, celebrate yourself, celebrate what you've done because so many people want to tell their stories and want to share a story and impact other people and they never do it. And even just writing alone in your room, if no one sees it is, I think a huge act of courage and part of what gives me hope for humanity in such a dark time. So just keep, keep writing. I love that. So we, we are coming up on time. Um, I'm going to ask one more question from the Q and a, and then I might include some of them for those of you who have never come to one of our HF gathers before. Um, we will pull a blog post together. We'll try and answer some additional questions that we might not have gotten to. Several of the questions have to do with craft, you know, literally the steps of turning, you know, memoir into fiction. And, you know, some of them have to do with researching and finding additional readers. And so we can kind of provide some uh, guidance for that. But this question I loved, um, this question came in and said, you know, what books recently have you read that you really feel center a child and also really holds that great 
um, uh, amount of hope and reality in them um, when it comes to grief or trauma. Um, what do you think has been out there? Yeah. I bet you all have yeah. just tons of titles. We probably don't have enough time for it. You wrote your thesis on this, Linda. Let's go. <laughs> yes. I, you know, it's so funny. I always have to schedule reading time because then time will go. And I'm like, wait, I haven't read a book. Like that's not anything to do with me. And I always, so, you know, it, it won the Caldecott this year. Uh, Vashti Harrison's, Harris. Oh my God, I'm ruining her name. Vashti Harris, I believe. My brain, but uh, big. It, you know, it's so funny um, <laughs> that, I, you know, I'd seen that book around, you know, it's, and she's a best-selling author. And, I, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to get to it. It's, it looks really cute. I thought it was just, I didn't know what it was going to be about, but it's about a girl who, you know, a brown, a black little girl who is big, right? Bigger than the other little girls. And I always like to see different kinds of characters represented, especially in terms of body shape, right? And what was beautiful about that story, it wasn't just, because I see a lot of body positivity, which is important. But in this story, the character kind of gets depressed. Like you see that she goes to a dark place and kids can handle that. I like it when you can show the dark side. Read that book. It's just so beautiful. It made me cry. It's beautifully done. And it was well, for all intents and purposes, it felt pretty dark. But at the end, there is a beautiful, hopeful message at the end of coming to love yourself. But there is this whole spread where you just see the darkness. And I think we need to see more stuff like that. So I love that book. I only read it like, a, you know, last month, which is so ridiculous because it's been out for a while. But yeah, I would please read it. It's so good. I love it. Great. I, I, mine is for older, um, kids and it, it really, um, this book sh presents trauma through the horror genre of YA. Um, and it's really dark. So there's content warnings in the beginning, but it is, I feed her to the beast and the beast is me by Jameson Shea. I listened to the audiobook and it is just like phenom amazing phenomenal but it's gruesome i you recommended that you're right <laughs> I, I i started that um i'm on a picture book kick and um i just want to do like a, a little plug um for one of our faculty members stephanie walker so she is um teaching at the our highlights retreat she's a clinical social worker with a specialization in um, trauma for children. And she wrote the most beautiful picture book called Lena and the Dragon. And it, it's just the most, it's like something happens, we don't know what. And this is how this child is experiencing feeling all the feelings and dealing with this every day. And if you want to see an example, and this is no matter if you're writing YA middle grade picture book, of trauma-informed writing, writing that allows the reader to be seen in their experience without going so, so dark that like, did they get, you know, triggered? It's a great book. It's really fabulous. I feel like, so now we've done picture book and we've done YA, I should throw in a, a middle grade here just so we can make sure and, and we have it. I don't know. Um, I'm going to go with um, Olabemi Sola, Rude Perkovic, uh, the You're Breaking My Heart. It has, it's a, it's, it's a gut punch of a book, but it's done so incredibly beautifully. Um, there is a, a sibling death in it and there are the way that the main character, you you really feel that tug of processing at that age level with fault. Um, what could be your fault? What did you do right and what did you do wrong? It's so it's so incredible. It's so beautifully done. Um, we could probably go on for the next hour with that, but but we'll 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 uh, we'll we'll take a step back from there and and we'll take a step back and we'll say thank you. 
we'll say thank you to to um to the to the three of you first oh. and foremost but thank you Allison and thank you to the attendees who yeah. are interested in this absolutely so a few additional words for me as we wrap up um, I'm going to say, especially for those who were asking questions about craft, you were looking for opportunities for learning. Um, I want to drop two links into the chat. One of them is part of our minis series. Minis are just two night classes. It's with um, Crystal Allen and Katie Kierden, and it's writing about mental health for middle grade and young adult readers. It's a two night mini. They're coming with writing exercises, tons of examples. They're coming in and um, sharing stories similar to what we talked about tonight, but then digging into um, how you're crafting your stories with that. Another one that I'll be placing in the chat is, um, well, along with uh, one of tonight's hosts, Heather Demetrios, we have um, A.S. King, um, Bethany Walker, who you just talked about, um, Padma Ventrakaman and Azra Rahim um, will be at the Highlights Foundation for the essential conversation that we have um, writing through trauma to empower readers. We really do believe that this program um, that is part of an essential conversation that we need to engage in um, for all of the reasons that you've talked about tonight. Um, this particular program offers support for creatives. And right before everyone came on, I was talking to Sarah and Heather and Linda and saying, um, so many people want to attend this program. We are grateful to the Hawthorndon Foundation, who has supported us with five scholarships um, to the program. We are grateful to Jane and Rebecca Dykes Writers, who is supporting us with one scholarship to the program. We have so many additional writers who um, are seeking support. So I'll also place a link um, if anyone is able at this time to provide any support. Um, we would love your support in, um, in getting more writers um, help to tell these stories. So I'll be placing them in the link. You'll also find them um, when we follow things up um, with all of you in the recording. And um, I'll just say, along with thanking our panelists tonight, um, I'm going to thank those who are here with me from the Highlights Foundation, George and everyone um, in the chat. And um, so our whole Highlights Foundation team, they help to make programming like this and all of the programming possible. Um, I do wanna say to those of you who have gathered, please stay safe. Please help us find some peace right now. Um, these stories help us speak up for children. They need to hear your voices right now. Um, they need you right now. So be safe and until next time, good night.